Hello chaps, welcome to John Robson Guitar Tuition once again. I do hope you're well. Now then, the title of this video is What I've Learned from Gary Moore. And that pretty much says it all really. It's a little bit of a personal perspective on the great Gary Moore's playing style. This is not the ultimate guide to becoming the world's leading Gary Moore tribute act. This is more a personal set of reflections and observations about what I've learned from his playing. In this video we're going to be looking at um, a particular type of chord sequence that underpinned many of his tunes. We're also going to look at how he would construct a melody, uh, those big memorable um, melodies that he would come up with, Parisian walkways, still got the blues, the loner, the prophet, all that kind of stuff. We're going to be looking at how you can come up with uh, a melody which is as memorable as that. We're also going to look at how you can add variations and interest to that melody as you move through the piece in order to keep it sounding fresh. And finally, we're going to take a look at uh, how I personally emulate three of Gary Moore's signature licks without having to spend uh, massive amounts of time learning to do them with Gary Moore style technique. The point I'm getting at here is that you can get close to the sound of Gary Moore or whoever your chosen uh, favourite uh, player is without having to slavishly copy what they do. Right, so let's move on first of all then with a look at that chord sequence I was mentioning. Okay, the first thing you need to know about this typical Gary Moore chord sequence is that it's based on something called the cycle of fourths. Now if that's gibberish to you, if that kind of particular term doesn't mean a lot to you, then let me just explain. Uh, basically, we're in the key of A minor, or we're going to be in the key of A minor for this tune. And if I take an A minor scale, like that, and if I count four notes up that, I come to a D note. Okay, then if I do the same thing but starting from a D, I come to a G note. If I do the same thing starting from a G, I come to a C note, and so on. And eventually, I will get to a point where I've landed on the note of E, and if I go up four notes from an E note, I come back to A. It's basically the cycle of fourths. If you go four notes up the scale from the first note, then four notes up the scale from the second note, then the third note, and so on, you will end up back at the note you started from. Uh, hence why it's called the cycle of fourths. And the thing about the cycle of fourths is it gives a very pleasing sound if you base a chord sequence on it. So in the key of A minor, if I start off on an A note, that's going to give me an A minor chord. Uh, as we discussed, go four notes up the A minor scale, that takes us to a D note, so we'll base a D minor chord on that. Four notes up a D minor scale takes me to a G note. Now, what I want to do here is stay within the key of A minor. So, in the key of A minor, um, the chord that I would get based on a G note is a G chord. But I'm actually going to change that a little bit here. I'm going to turn it into a G 11th chord, which sounds scary until you realise that all it is is an F chord with a G note in the bass. So, so far I've got A minor going to D minor. I might play that as a minor 7th actually. Then a G 11th. Uh, what's next? Well, if I go four notes up a G scale, it takes me to a C note. So I'm going to make a C major 7th chord out of that. Four notes up the scale from C takes me to F, so I'm going to make an F major 7th out of that. Now, if I go four notes up from the F note, it takes me to a B flat, which is outside the key of A minor. So I don't want to go there. 
Um, what I'll do instead is I'll go from that F major 7th into a related chord, it's relative minor, the D minor. Um, from there what I can do is I can place a B bass note under that D minor chord uh, and that gives me the wonderfully named B minor 7 flat 5 or B half diminished as it's sometimes called. Sounds like that. Quite a tense, ugly sounding chord, but that leads nicely into the E7 again. And why I say again there is because um, we're back into the cycle of fourths thing again here with the uh, if I go four notes up the scale from a B note, I arrive at E. And as we discussed earlier, what we get if we go four notes up the scale from an E note is it takes us back to the A again giving us the A minor chord. So those chords there are A minor, D minor, or minor seventh, G11, C major seventh, F major seventh, to D minor, to the D minor with a B bass note, the B minor seven flat five, to an E7, back to A minor again. Here's that played as uh, continuous set of chords. Now interestingly, one of the things that I learned from studying this kind of chord sequence was how to play jazz. Um, it doesn't really sound much like jazz, but trust me, it is. That chord sequence there is essentially the same chord sequence as underpins many of the classic jazz standards. Things like, well, Autumn Leaves springs to mind. But anyway... Um, now we've got the chord sequence sorted out, I guess the next thing we need to do is look at how we can put a melody on top of that. A big, warm, memorable, showstopper of a melody that Gary Moore was quite famous for. So let's have a look at how you can do that. Okay, the biggest thing that you need to know in order to put together um, a really memorable sounding melody is you have to have some idea pretty good idea as it happens, of what notes are in each of the chords that you're playing over. Um, some people find that fairly obvious. Uh, you just look at the chord shape and know what notes are in it. Um, but for those of you who are maybe going to struggle a little bit with that, here is a quick guide to understanding what notes are in any of the chords, in this sequence at least. Okay, to figure out what notes are in a major chord, for example, let's use C as our root note. You take that root note, then you go four frets above that. So four frets up from a C would be an E note, and then you go three frets up from that. So three frets up from an E note is a G. Therefore, the three notes in a C chord are C, E and G, C major chord. If we wanted to know what's in a minor chord, well, we just reverse that three and four fret um, relationship. So if you wanted to know what notes are in an A minor chord, for example, you take the root note, A, then you go up three frets from that, which takes you to a C note. Then you go up four frets from that C note, which we already know takes us to an E. And there you have your notes in an A minor chord, A, C, and E, and so on. So what's happening in a major 7th chord then? Well, you just do the same steps as you would for a major chord. 4 frets up from the root, and then 3. And then you add another 4 fret interval on the end. So C major 7, for example. We know that's got a C major chord in it. C, E and G. Then we go 4 frets up from that G note, which takes us to a B. And there's the notes in that chord. How about a minor 7th chord? Well, we just do the same kind of thing as we did in the previous step. You take the minor chord, which is 3 plus 4, 
so an A minor chord we know gives us an A, a C and an E note and then we go another three frets on top of that so what's three frets above the final note in that chord? E well it takes us to G so the notes in an A minor seventh chord are A, C and E plus the G note moving on we now come to seventh chords there is an E7th in our chord sequence so what do we uh, need for that then well we first of all build an E major chord so that's an E note then we go four frets up from the E which takes us to G sharp then we go three frets up from the G sharp which takes us to B and then to turn it into a seventh we go another three frets up from that which takes us to a D note so there are the notes in your E seventh chord E, G sharp and B making the E major then another three frets up takes us to a D making it into an E seventh Next up we have 11th chords. Now the easiest way to play an 11th chord is simply to play the chord two frets below it, the major chord two frets below it. So if you want a G11 like we have in this particular tune, you go two frets below the G, which takes us to an F chord, and we simply play that F chord on top of a G bass note. Easy. Uh, moving on, the final type of chord that we're looking at here is the minor 7 flat 5 chord. Now this, simply because it's got a, a long sounding name, is a chord that can scare a lot of people off. But all you have to do here is play a minor chord. Let's say we want B minor 7 flat 5. We find the B note, then we play the minor chord that you would find three frets above that root note. So three frets above a B root note is a D, so you play a D minor chord on top of a B bass note, you get B minor 7 flat 5. Right, and with that knowledge you can potentially figure out what any of the notes are in the chords in this sequence. But because I'm feeling generous I thought I'd save you the trouble. We're going to be doing a little bit of stuff on note choices um, coming up shortly and in order to kind of illustrate that I've knocked up a little Chord Pulse sort of temporary backing track using Chord Pulse software that we'll uh, use for that. So here it is and you'll see the chords kind of ticking past and you'll also see underneath each chord what notes are in that chord. Okay, next up what I'm going to do is choose one of the notes from each chord to use as sort of the main focal point for any lick or phrase that I'm going to end up playing over uh, that chord. Uh, you'll see in the corner of the screen um, the notes that I'm choosing as the chords go by and you'll also be able to see me playing them on the neck of the guitar. Here's what that's going to look and sound like. Okay, that takes us a long way to having a melody that we can use. Really speaking, the, the next step is just a question of stitching all of that together. Now, I mentioned earlier on in the uh, video when I was talking about going up the cycle of fourths, I mentioned the A minor scale. Now, the notes in the A minor scale are simply 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then back to A again. That's called the A natural minor scale, or the A aeolian mode. This isn't really a lesson on scale, so if you need to brush up on that, um, take a look at some of the other videos that I've done on that very subject. But let's assume for the moment that you are reasonably confident in your ability to uh, find your way around those notes on the neck. You just use those notes now to stitch that um, those chosen targeted chord notes together. And you might end up with something that sounds and looks a bit like this. Okay, that gives us a pretty good starting point from which to develop a more worked melody. Um, the next thing you need to do is decide whereabouts you're going to use things like hammer-ons, pull-offs, bends, slides, that kind of thing. And it's worthwhile spending a fair amount of time on this deciding on, or coming up with rather, as many different variations as you can. Break the melody down into individual phrases and then figure out how many different ways you can play each of those phrases using different combinations of hammer-ons, pull-offs, slides and bends and so on. The reason why this is uh, an important thing to do is because we're working on an instrumental tune here. Now the thing that an instrumental tune lacks are lyrics. Okay? You don't have a different set of lyrics for verse 2 as you had for verse 1. You've just got the same melody. So you need to find some way of making that melody sound subtly different in the same way as a different set of lyrics for the second verse would make the, melod the verse melody that the singer was singing sound subtly different. You know what I'm saying. Anyway, let's take that first phrase in uh, the piece, which goes like this. It's the one based around the C note for the A minor chord. It goes like this. Now, here are just a few different variations on that phrase that I came up with just straight off the top of my head using, as I say, all the different slurring techniques. Okay, so use that as an example of how you can figure out as many ways as you can of using hammer-ons, bends, slides, pull-offs, etc. to present every phrase in the melody in a slightly different way each time. It's also a good idea to learn to play your m melodic phrases in different octaves. So that melody that we've been kind of developing so far... Where would it be an octave lower? An octave higher? Like that maybe. All of these different variations are all um, just ways, as I say, of making the melody sound fresh and new and just that bit more interesting each time you come back to essentially the same melody for every verse. And it's also worthwhile talking at this point about another little trick that Gary Moore often used to use uh, when kind of thinking in melodic terms. I'm talking about something called the appoggiatura. There it is. Now then, what is an appoggiatura? Well, put simply, it is a wrong note. Um, so far, everything that we've been doing has been geared towards kind of choosing a note that's there in the underlying chord and basing the phrase that sits on top of that chord largely around that note. 
But what happens if you choose a note that is from outside the chord, or if you're feeling brave, outside the overall scale? Well, we can get some really rather nice effects. Um, let's take that phrase there, which is based around the C note for the A minor chord. And let's change it a little bit. Let's change it so that I'm making a bigger play of the B note. Um, I could change the phrase to maybe something like... Like that, and just hanging on to that B note over the A minor chord is going to sound quite tense and oh that's not very comfortable yeah okay and then you land on the C note after it and it, it sounds more fulfilling as a result it's a classic example of something known as tension and release in kind of a movie plot it would be like a, a cliffhanger that keeps you interested to see what's going to happen next here it is where I'm just going to loop an A minor chord around and show you what um, what a difference it makes to the phrase. I'll play the phrase without the appoggiatura to begin with and then I'll play it with. So hopefully you can hear that that has quite a pronounced effect on the sound. It really adds to that sense of yearning and slightly kind of reaching for something that's just beyond your grasp that is exactly the kind of feel that you need to give to um, these kind of big melodic ballad type uh, melodies. Now before we move on to the final part of this video where I show you how I emulate three different typical Gary Moore licks without really being able to play like Gary Moore. Uh, there's one final uh, point I want to make about the melodic side of things. Um, when you get a little bit further on into a tune, when you've played, you maybe you're on the third verse or something, uh, basically you've played the melody a couple of times already, it's really well established in the listener's mind. What you can then do is start taking a few liberties with it and start putting the odd little flourish around the melody. It doesn't have to be anything flash. The fact that you've probably been playing the melody in quite a sedate, laid-back fashion up to this point is going to make anything even slightly kind of twiddly sounding stand out as being, you know, something that catches the ear. Um, a good example of this where you'll find Gary doing exactly this kind of thing is right towards the end of a track called The Loner from the Wild Frontier album. Um, the final sort of refrain of that where it's uh, the basic melody is something like something like that, I forget it now, but basically that section of the tune, um, he really does kind of go to town with his little flourishy bits that were missing or absent from earlier earlier incarnations of that part of the melody because he was still at that kind of stage making it a familiar melody to the listener. Once it becomes a familiar melody you can, as I say, start playing around with it. Using that example phrase that I've been using for all of these um, illustrations I'm going to show you now how I would add a few little flourishes around um, a uh, kind of familiar sounding melodic phrase. Right, that wraps up the melodic side of things for the moment. Now let's take a look at how Gary would 
tackle the improvised section, the solo of a tune. And this is where we get to see how I emulate three signature Gary Moore licks without having Gary Moore levels of talent. Okay, take a listen to these three typical Gary Moore licks and then I'm going to show you how I approach getting something that sounds a bit similar. Okay, the first of those three licks, which incidentally comes from the solo from Waiting for an Alibi off the Thin Lizzy album Black Rose. Uh, basically, I think it's in C-sharp minor in its original key, so if we're thinking around position one of the pentatonic, we're here. So that's just to give you some context as to where this lick kind of crops up on the neck. Um, basically, we do this two fret bend on the third string, followed by first and or second and first strings, like that, so you're getting that kind of thing. At this stage, it's not too dissimilar from um, a Chuck Berry lick. Um, anyway, after that little uh, trio of notes, we do a pull-off from the 12th fret to the 9th fret. Like that. And the, the lick itself is simply that repeated over and over. And the problem I have with it is... On the way back up, my pick just seems to kind of um, get stuck in between the strings. I also, um, and this is a real Gary Moorism here, I tend to play it in a more three-fingered way. Uh, further down the neck in a lower key where the frets are further apart, it feels comfortable to do it with the little finger, but up here uh, I'm going to be doing it with a three-fingered approach. So you need good strength in this finger to get that bend. And literally all I'm doing is kind of almost as well, it's not almost, it is a sweet pick across those three notes like that with the, um, the bend at the beginning. There it is there. And then the kind of final part of, of the, the lick, which is this bit here, I don't even bother picking that, I just go like that and I can uh, get some pretty impressive speed uh, simply by doing it like that. Just a single sweep pick and then uh, hammer onto this note to do the uh, final pull off part of the lick. So here's how that would sound slowly. And then with a bit of fire behind it. kind of thing. So that's how I do that particular lick. Right, this next lick um, is something that Gary would do again and again and again in many solos. Uh, it consists of a series of very, very fast hammer-on and pull-offs from an open string. Um, the lick in question comes from um, Walking By Myself from the Still Got The Blues album and it's played over a B chord. <laughs> Uh, so what he tends to do is just outline some notes from um, like a B mixolydian mode kind of thing basically. He plays the, the major third of the chord, uh, hammering on and pulling off to the open B string which is the root of the chord. Then he plays the, the E note which is just part of the overall uh, B major or B mixolydian scale. Again hammer on, pull off to the open string. And then he goes to the F-sharp note at the 7th fret again. Hammer on and pull off to the open B string, giving us the root note of the chord. So that would go... And as you can see, I'm really starting to um, run out of talent uh, trying to get that up to speed. So I don't bother. Um, basically, I create a similar sound. Uh, by using a Joe Satriani technique, uh, which sounds really impressive, but it's, it's the easiest thing in the world to do, to be honest. Um, use the side of your pick to just trill on 
any note you want. In this case, I'm going to use the um, 12th fret B string, which is giving me the uh, B note rather than the open B string. And then I'll just use those same three notes, 4th fret D sharp, 5th fret A, 7th fret uh, F sharp, to just create a very similar sounding run. And there you have it. And for me, that is just infinitely more easy than doing the open uh, string pull-off kind of thing. It also helps if you're um, trying to do a lick like that, um, if you're playing in a key where you don't really have a, an open string note that's going to work for you. Um, I used to play this song in a band that I was in all back in the early 90s, not long after the album had came out, and that's how I used to play that part of the solo. And... Um, Everyone used to come, well not everyone, but people used to come up to me at the, uh, at the end of the gig and say, wow, you really nailed that Gary Moore solo. I've seen loads of bands play that and nobody plays the solo right apart from you. <laughs> of course, I didn't let them in on the secret. But that's it, it sounds similar and you can get away with it, basically. Right, let's move on to the final uh, of the trio of Gary Moore signature licks that we're going to look at. Okay, this final lick um, is another kind of hammer-on and pull-off type thing. Gary often used to do this sort of thing at the uh, climax of a solo, and you would usually find it um, based around pattern number one of the pentatonic scale. Um, I'm going to show you this in D minor because where I use this lick in the solo that's coming up at the end of the video, I'm playing it in D minor. Um, Typical things that he used to do in this pattern with hammer-ons and pull-offs would be um, something like this maybe where he's doing a hammer-on pull-off on, pull -off on uh, one particular string and then onto the uh, second of the two notes on the string below it. So you get... Now that sounds reasonably fast but it's not Gary Moore type speed. Um, so what I tend to do in these circumstances, if I want to do something like that, is I will tap and I will go for something like this. Okay. Like that, and I can bring that down a scale. And that still, for my ear anyway, has a touch of the Gary Moore about it. And that's how I achieve that kind of um, speed with kind of hammer-on and pull-off uh, licks based in kind of pattern one or any other pattern of the pentatonic scale for that matter. If finger tapping is something that's new to you, then you'll find a link in the description box below this video for a full kind of tutorial on how to get uh, that technique up and running. Believe me, it is nowhere near as difficult as it sounds. It's just that kind of thing and then with a metronome build up the speed. Um, well that goes for all of these licks as well. Begin them slowly and um, work them up to speed with a metronome. Don't try playing faster than your fingers want to move because it's a recipe for disaster. Okay, there are my three approaches to playing Gary Moore style licks. And there it is folks, that is what I've learned from Gary Moore. Coming up next you're going to see um, me playing a short sort of Gary Moore pastiche uh, maybe it should be called Still in Love with the Parisian Loner's Blues for You or something like that. It's very much a, an amalgam of all of those uh, tracks really. Uh, see if you can spot while you're watching this me using all of the techniques I've spoken about here. From the targeted chord notes, uh, using the appoggiaturas, using the different um, incarnations of each phrase using uh, different combinations of hammer-ons, bends, slides and pull-offs um, and also see if you can spot me using variations on those licks that we've just been talking about. 
Uh, and with that, I will bid you good day with uh, just a quick mention for the fact that I have a couple of albums out at the moment. Uh, if you're a fan of Gary Mowat, then you're probably going to like these albums as well because they're full of shreddy, bluesy, rock, melodic guitar work. Um, what's not to like there? They're available on all major platforms. Uh, the album that came out earlier on in the year is called The Whiskey Made Me Do It, because it did. And the most recent one is called Handles for Forks. As I say, there's a link in the description below as to where you can get these albums. And um, yeah, check them out. You'll enjoy them, I promise you. Uh, I'll also just mention that if you are looking for tailored one-to-one -one guitar tuition in any style, uh, any age, any level of ability from beginner right the way up to advanced, then get in touch with me. If you live on Teesside, I do lessons face to face and wherever you are in the world you can have Skype lessons with me and whichever way you do it, your first lesson is free. So there really is nothing to lose. And with that I'll bid you a good day and see you all next time. Bye for now folks.